Foster Dulles, one of two senior partners along with his brother Alan Dulles, and we just saw them, you'll recall, at work with the CI official Wisner and Reinhard Galen in promoting the special forces. The Dawes plan was drawn up by John Foster Dulles, who was appointed as uh, special counsel to the Dawes committee by J.P. Morgan, John Pierpont Morgan. Now, the uh, reparations loans were utilized by many of the... Uh, companies which got them to basically buy out their competition. It put them in a superior position with regard to commercial competition, and these loans had a great deal to do with the consolidation of three large German cartels. First of all, the former uh, loose association of the German dye stuffs industry, the so-called community of interests or Interessen Gemeinschaft Farben industry, became formally one company, IG Farben, and the uh, the reparations loans, the loans provided under the Dawes and Young plan, had a fair amount to do with the formal consolidation of what had been a loosely knit community of interests of separate companies, their formal consolidation into one company, IG Farben. The two other large cartels that grew out of this plan were the Vereinigte Stahlwerke, the so-called United Steel, and the Algemeine Elektrizitätsgesellschaft, the AEG, the German General Electric, 30% owned by General Electric in the United States. Okay, now these cartels, as I said, not only uh, helped provide Hitler with many of his war, uh, in fact, provided per- they they were the backbone of German war production. They also had a great deal to do with financing Hitler's rise to power. So the problem of German cartels was very much connected with the problem of denazification and. Uh, it is worth noting that these cartels uh, wielded tremendous influence not only in Germany and the conquered nations, but all over the world. And uh, one of the men who was uh, in charge with dealing with the international effects of these cartels, basically with attempting to blunt the uh, international actions of these cartels uh, in order to hamper German war production, was a man named James Stuart Martin. Now, James Stuart Martin was head of the, it was something called the Economic Warfare Section of the Antitrust Division of the Department of Justice during World War II. He worked with, among others, a man named Joseph Borkin, B-O-R-K-I-N, who wrote a recent uh, bestseller about I.G. Farben a few years back called The Crime and Punishment of I.G. Farben. Now, James Stuart Martin not only worked against the cartels during the war, he was head of the so-called bombing section, that's what they called his economic warfare section, because they, in addition to uh, attempting to blunt the international uh, affairs, the international business dealings of the cartels, which brought Nazi Germany a great deal of profit from its far- their foreign markets, but he also had a lot to do with advising the uh, U.S. Army Air Force on which targets to bomb. And after the war, James Stuart Martin was very much involved with the attempt at breaking up the German cartels. Now, keep in mind that the German cartels were very much connected, because a cartel is an international monopoly, that was very much, they were very much connected with not only American, but also British, French, and other countries' industrial interests. And uh, the breaking up of the cartels, that so-called decartelization of Germany, was a major element of denazification. Now, as we've seen, John J. McCloy returned many Nazi war criminals right back into German life. He released Alfred Krupp and some of the other industrialists. And uh, James Stuart Martin wrote a book about his wartime experiences and post-war experiences. And that book was called All Honorable Men. And All Honorable Men was copyrighted in 1950 and published in hardcover by Little Brown and Company. And in the story of decartelization, we're going to encounter a name that we've heard before. Okay, indeed. And you will also remember, if you listen to the first broadcast, that that self-same gentleman whose name we're talking about showed up, and he was none other than Herbert Hoover. At the time of the end of the First World War, of course, this was prior to his presidency, and uh, at that time he was in charge of food relief for war-ravaged Europe after the end of World War I. Russia, of course, had dropped out of World War I uh, during the time of the revolution there, the Bolshevik Revolution. And by the end of the war, the Bolsheviks were firmly in power in Russia. Now, as you also will remember, one of the main things that, that we talked about in regards to Herbert Hoover is how he lost millions of dollars in oil interests when the Bolsheviks nationalized the oil fields in Russia. 
Um, we also mentioned the fact that Herbert Hoover, in charge of food relief, strangely enough, couldn't seem to get any of the food relief money into Bolshevik Russia, even though Bolshevik Russia had been one of the areas hardest hit by the famines that resulted from World War I. And in fact, a lot of the food relief seemed to be going to the white Russian emigre groups who were setting up to reinvade Russia and throw the Bolsheviks out and reinstall czarism. And uh, that Hoover, in fact, was channeling food to these groups and to other groups such as the Poles who were uh, going to take advantage and uh, in themselves carve a little territory out of Russia. So Herbert Hoover, in fact, uh, his activities angered so many people that, in fact, one of the things we read was uh, an editorial talking about the personal vendetta, the private war that Herbert Hoover and others were carrying on against the, uh, the Bolsheviks all by themselves at that time. Now, the time that we are talking about is after World War II. Sir Hoover, Hoover has already been president, and son of a gun, if he doesn't show up again in a position to have an influence on the uh, the status of the status quo as regards world or Western uh, European and American uh, position towards uh, communism, and to also to the building up of anti-communist forces once again. Bear in mind also that as we're talking about decartelization, the economic issues are very difficult and very complicated in some ways. However, a very important thing to remember is when asked to give a definition of fascism, Mussolini, Benito Mussolini, the fascist dictator of Italy, said, first of all, it is corporatism. What we're talking about, in fact, is the consolidation of corporate power and hence the ability of the state in conjunction with the corporation to basically take over economic life, link it intimately to whatever that state's nationalist and aggressive goals might be. And in fact, a non-corporatized country um, really cannot be an effective fascist country. So bear in mind that decartelization is, uh, or in, in our cases it would be, de um, other cases would be demonopolization or the breaking up of trusts, um, is of vital importance for any group of people that wish to remove the possibilities of a resurgence of fascism. And remember that Herbert Hoover, in our first uh, installment of this program, you misused alleged food relief, his uh, mission to feed the starving peoples of Eastern Europe. He misused that food relief as uh, basically sort of a tool for covert action against the Soviet Union. Okay, again, this is from the book All Honorable Men by James Stuart Martin. Uh, again, the gentleman who was working in the Office of Economic Warfare. This is copyright 1950, Little Brown and Company. And Mr. Martin writes as follows. Early in February... Opposition from an older and more familiar quarter showed itself. This is February of 1947, by the way. We had been so absorbed with details of the passage of the law that the chief problem, controlling the mainspring of German economic warfare, had been briefly eclipsed. The reminder came with Herbert Hoover's visit to Germany at the suggestion of President Truman. Though he had been asked principally to study the German food problem, Again, Hoover and food. Mr. Hoover fanned out very broadly into all phases of economics and politics. A restatement of the traditional German resistance to reform was the result. The specific problems of feeding occupied only one part of his report. The principal focus was on general economic problems. And on these, the advice came from the late Gustav Stolper, former German economist, who was at Mr. Hoover's elbow throughout the trip. At Berlin, there was the usual briefing of the Hoover Party by the Economics Division, with the bulk of the time allocated to problems of German reconstruction and a brief period at the end for problems of economic power. This time, there was a difference. After representatives of the industry and the trade and commerce branches had made their usual remarks about the hampering effect of the anti-cartel program, the decartelization branch representative replied by describing the new law. Thereupon, Herbert Hoover remarked that he could see nothing wrong with such a law and thought a, quote, antitrust law might be a very good thing in Germany. Okay, so Hoover is saying to these people in the economic division that he thinks antitrust or anti-cartel legislation is fine, okay, which is what the economic people wanted. Um, after the briefing, Dr. Stolper showed some agitation over Mr. Hoover's remarks. He circulated among the group, arguing that the new law was a, quote, very bad thing for Germany. It was just like the denazification policy. The main job of denazification had been done by Hitler himself when he committed suicide. This is the author explaining Stolper's viewpoint. Even the hanging of the other top Nazis had gone too far. The same was true of the cartels and combines. 
the war had ended Germany's, quote, concentration of economic power. Decartelization and other such reforms were in reality aimed at destroying Germany and the German character, including the many good things in the German tradition. The text of the Herbert Hoover Report of 1947 did not reflect any of Mr. Hoover's favorable remarks about antitrust laws. The report concluded that concessions must be made to the old line financiers and industrialists in order to obtain the help of their management abilities in European recovery. The, quote, reform policies showed up as a deterrent to recovery. Bear in mind, also, when we're talking about the old line financiers and industrialists, we're talking about the people who bankrolled the entire Third Reich. And in essence, then, the decision was to put them right back into power again, um, the professed reason being that Reconstruction was vitally important. Why? To fight the Soviet Union. Skipping on down in the book, still reading from All Honorable Men, on May 3rd, a Berlin dispatch announced the end of another in a series of tours of Germany and Austria, which the War Department had been sponsoring to enlighten influential people about the problems of occupation. In this case, as the New York Times put it, quote, 14 top business executives of the United States concluded today a two weeks tour of the key cities of Germany and Austria. They made the trip at the request of Secretary of War Robert P. Patterson to study German industry and the military government's industrial program. The War Department on May 8, 1947 released the report prepared by the 14 top business executives. The statement began by affirming their, quote, complete and unanimous agreement with the conclusions of the Herbert Hoover Report. On the basis of their two weeks tour, they found it a masterful summary of the situation in Germany, unquote. Then the executives presented their first recommendation. They said, We now set forth several major issues with which the Office of Military Government has to deal, together with our comments and suggestions thereon. 1. Decartelization. Law 56 and Regulation No. 1 embody a series of controls and regulations, many of which represent economic principles quite new to the German mind and to the past industrial development of the country. Since we are now confronted with the urgent necessity of bringing about as rapidly as possible recovery of the economic life of a starving people, it is our belief that too strict adherence to the law in its administration will seriously retard this primary objective. With no desire to criticize the principle of this law, as it has been written, we do, however, recommend, if at all possible, that the enforcement of these regulations be postponed, or at least substantially modified, until the industrial economy is in a reasonable state of operation. The author says other recommendations, including the need for, quote, incentives to German industry, agriculture, and labor, the promotion of exports, the downward revision of reparations, the end of denazification, and change in the level of industry. Now, just very briefly, go back and point something out here. What they say in the first part of this statement, these business executives, is that decartelization represent economic, represents economic principles quite new to the German mind into the past industrial development of the country and that it hence should be scaled back or eliminated. What they're in fact saying is that the fascist concentration of power in the whatever you want to call it, the ruling class, the oligarchy, you know, the, the military and, and, uh, um, and business uh, axis uh, is something that they're used to, and it should not be scaled down because we have to rapidly redevelop the country, supposedly to help starving people. Um, we, of course, know uh, at least better what some of the reasons for that might be. Two points to make uh, about uh, the so-called Hoover Report. First of all, you'll recall that on the passage Nip Tuck read you, Herbert Hoover at least verbally said that he thought an antitrust law for Germany might not be a bad thing, but... Under the uh, influence, one, one might say, or uh, in conjunction with uh, Gustav Stolper, he apparently, because uh, he, he, he incorporated Stolper's ideas into his uh, passage, in, into his uh, report, he went along with Stolper's basic recommendations that the Nazi industrial uh, establishment be kept in, or the pro-Nazi, well, basically the Nazi industrial establishment be, be maintained intact, in Germany. So one has to ask what were Herbert Hoover's motives? He at least 
if we're to take his statements at face value, and he was a very outspoken man in the first uh, part of this series, we, did, we heard his statement that Bolshevism is worse than war. Uh, he was not, at least in principle, opposed to antitrust laws, yet he elected to recommend against decartalization, and for all intents and purposes, that meant uh, re recommending against denazification. One has to ask what purpose he had in mind. Certainly we can't answer that for sure, but uh, the possibility that uh, he wanted to keep uh, Nazism in Germany for the purposes of political reaction, either for, uh, again, another ticket back into Soviet Russia, because he had roughly a billion dollars in 1912 dollars of holdings in Russia, or at the very least from before keeping Germany as a tool against Russia is at least one of the things that we have to keep in mind. Now, as uh, I mentioned a couple of minutes ago, one of the very large cartels that uh, was very much involved with the arming of Germany and with the rise to power of Hitler, in fact, one American and one uh, German set of IG Farben, Farben was Hitler and Hitler was Farben, was the aforementioned IG Farben, the Interessen Gemeinschaft Farben Industry, which was a large cartel that grew out of the former German dye stuff companies, okay, the German chemical companies. When the IG Farben company was very much involved with the chemical and petroleum industries all over the world. Every company had it, every country had its uh, IG Farben affiliates. Remember in the first broadcast we looked at the Pirelli Industrial Empire in Italy that was very much connected with IG Farben. A number of Vichy or fascist French industrialists very much connected and their Franco-German trusts, the Franco-German North African trusts, very much affiliated with the IG Farben, and the breakup of IG Farben was hotly debated in the United States Congress because IG was heavily, uh, very strongly affiliated with many very influential American companies, and uh, this is something that we will be talking about in our uh, Uncle Sam and the Swastika program coming, coming up. Now, IG Farben was very much involved with American companies, and uh, in just a second I'm going to tell you about uh, a little, an interesting chapter from the attempted breakup of IG Farben. Okay, now again, to, to sort of put this in, a, in, in another type of perspective, something to be very much aware of for those of you who are just coming into some of this kind of stuff. Now, whether you believe um, in, in Adam Smith or in Marx and Engels, whether you believe in capitalism or communism um, or neither, uh, it should be very evident to you that war and peace almost always hinge on matters of economy, on matters of money, who's got it, who's using it, what they're using it for, and how, if at all, they are being controlled. Now, again, some of the stuff about decartalization, about IG Farben, about the various German combines and, and allied participation therein, is complicated stuff in terms of it's not the kind of thing that makes great cocktail party chatter. However... Um, this is vital to understand because, as some other uh, uh, wit whose name skips my mind right at the moment once said, uh, capital knows no country. And what we are in fact talking about are not necessarily cases of this flag is, is fighting this flag, but in fact this group of people with money have the same sort of objectives regardless of what country they live in, and hence they will band together to, uh, to unite against this other group of people. So don't let the fact of, of where somebody lives or what country they're in uh, fool you that they are necessarily following that country's national interests. I guess that's the overall point I'm trying to make. We're talking about money and people having money and wanting to protect property and own property and utilize it, and that is in fact what leads to a lot of these situations. Okay, now, as I mentioned, the proposed decard, the, the proposed breakup of IG Farben was hotly debated in the United States Congress because it was a a world power, IG Farben, that is to say, was a world power, and it, it uh, had many, many tentacles into the United States as well. Now, a man who was called upon as an expert uh, witness in the congressional hearings about IG Farben wrote a book about his experiences. That man's name is Howard Watson Ambruster, last name A-M-B-R-U-S-T-E-R, -E and he wrote an excellent uh, book about IG Farben called Treason's Peace, subtitled German Dies and American Dupes. And Howard Watson Ambruster's Treason's Peace was published in hardcover by the Beechhurst Press in 1947. And the section I'm going to read you here from Treason's Peace concerns one of the fiercest congressional opponents of I.G. Farben, one of the congressmen who worked hardest to uh, achieve the breakup of I.G. Farben. That was a congressman from California named Jerry Voorhees, last name V-O-O-R-H-I-S. Now, Jerry Voorhees 
was defeated by Richard Nixon. Richard Nixon's first successful election campaign was in unseating Jerry Voorhees, his U.S. representative. And we're going to read you here from treason. I'm going to read you here from treason's piece about Jerry Voorhees' activities against, or his lobbying against I.G. Farben in the United States Congress. Again, from treason's piece by Howard Watson Ambrister. While the tug of war was going on in the United States Senate between the Save Farben and Smash Farben teams, important contributions were made by those two valiant battlers, representatives Voorhees of California and Coffee of Washington. Among the several forceful speeches by Mr. Voorhees touching on the I.G. Farben tie-ups in the United States was that delivered on May 21, 1945, in support of his House Concurrent Resolution 55, which demanded that the government prevent the economic, financial, or technical resources of, of Germany from rebuilding the future war potential of the enemy in any other nation and to prevent any citizens or corporations of the United States taking any action, quote, through cartel agreements or otherwise, unquote, which would contribute to the rebuilding of that future war potential. Again, on July 20th, 1945, Mr. Voorhees complained bitterly that, quote, some of the very people who hold top positions in the American Control Commission in Germany are men who either in the past or at this very moment are officials of the American companies who had connections with, with some of the very German companies which the Senate Kilgore Committee has warned about. Mr. Voorhees also put his finger on the issue by saying that, quote, to select men with connections of this sort and to pass over the thousands of other American businessmen whose companies never had any such connections is, to put the matter very mildly indeed, a mistake which may have the most serious consequences for the future peace of the world. So keep in mind Mr. Voorhees' attempts to, uh, to through American legislation, break up I.G. Farben by removing I.G. Farben's sympathizers and business contacts, contacts from the American Control Commission in Germany. Keep in mind his efforts in that regard, because we're going to be touching back on uh, Richard Nixon and uh, Mr. Voorhees a little later. Again, to point out some of the larger patterns here that we have, um, a situation in which, uh, at that time, Congressman Voorhees is saying that um, the American uh, uh, American uh, patriotism or you know uh, loyalty to democratic ideals should outweigh... Uh, a, interest in pure profits and connections with with fascist governments okay essentially is that that was Voorhees's point Voorhees was defeated by Richard Nixon um, with heavy outside funding uh, we will later see other people who propound similar viewpoints okay bear in mind people who propound similar viewpoints that that loyalty to democracy is more important than profits and anti-communism uh, promulgated through fascism other people who Richard Nixon sharpens his political teeth on uh, in much the same situation. This is not an isolated incident. Now, one of the interesting things uh, about the recent post-war, about the early post-war period that people are not aware of, is the fact that uh, just as the Nazi industrial structure was reinstituted in Germany, and this is going to come as a great surprise to a lot of people, I suspect, the Nazi political leadership, to an amazing extent, was returned to power in Germany. And although the post-war German leadership has been portrayed as uh, very unsullied and non-Nazi, this is not, in fact, the case. And, in fact, the Nazi connections of the German leadership touch even on Konrad Adenauer, the first German head of state, nicknamed Der Alta. Indeed. And uh, we're going to read here from a section of a book called The Borman Brotherhood by William Stevenson. This is a Bantam book in paperback, copyright 1974. Keep in mind that William Stevenson was a former British intelligence agent and specifically worked with a special operations executive which uh, conducted covert operations on the European mainland during the war. So he was an actual veteran of the struggle against the Nazis. Also, his name is S-T-E-V-E-N-S-O-N. That's worth keeping in mind because there's also another very, very famous British intelligence agent named William Stevenson. But his name is S T E P H E N S O N, and he's the uh, very well known intrepid. This is a different fellow, though. Okay, now what he is talking about, William Stevenson is talking about here, um, is uh, a quote uh, that, uh, that Conrad Adenauer made in 1963. Now, Conrad Adenauer was Chancellor of West Germany from 1949 to 1963. Um, and uh, basically told people all along that he was, uh, you know, a, an anti-Nazi resistance hero, et cetera, et cetera. And uh, the reaction Stevenson is having in the book here is to a comment that, uh, that Adenauer made in 1963 that, quote, he was always an opponent of the Nazis. And Stevenson writes as follows, 
I remembered a letter published in East Germany, later authenticated by the Chancellor, meaning Adenauer admitted to writing this letter, and written originally on August 10, 1934. It was a begging letter from Adenauer to the Prussian and Reich Minister of the Interior, asking for payment of his pension as Lord Mayor of Cologne. Uh, in, in other words, this was being written during the time that the Third Reich was in power. The pension was restored, and it was still being paid him at war's end, when he cultivated his own garden with French slave laborers. The ten-page letter was an attempt to prove that he had always been friendly to the Nazi party. Quote, I have always treated it in an absolutely correct manner, and in so doing I found myself at loggerheads with ministerial directives. For years, contrary to the decrees of the Prussian Ministry of the Interior, I made available to the party the municipal sports ground and allowed the party to hoist its swastika flag. I urged that municipal advertising should be given to the Nazi party newspaper in Cologne, the Westdeutschen Beobachter. Anyway, the letter goes on and on. Basically, Adenauer's whole point is he's writing to the Reich ministers, I have always been the Nazis' best friend friend, you know, when I was the mayor of Cologne, how could you, you know, not give me my pension? Then, of course, after the war, he turns around and says, I was always a, a firm opponent of the Nazis. Now, this in and of itself is not evidence of anything in particular, other than the fact that Adenauer is double-dealing and hypocritical. However, when we're talking about the issue of failed denazification, we're talking about some hard facts about some rather unpleasant people. It's also worth very significant there is the passage that his garden was maintained with French slave laborers. Now, under Third Reich policy, you didn't get your own slave laborers unless you worked very closely with the Nazis. I mean, not everybody got slaves. If he had slaves, whether or not he was a member of the Nazi party, he worked with the Reich to execute Third Reich policy. That's an important point. You just didn't get slave laborers. That means he has to, if not joining the Nazi party, and there's no record that he ever did, he certainly worked with them and was considered a political ally. That point is key here. Now, we're going to begin reading to you from an excellent book called The New Germany and the Old Nazis. That book was published by Random House, copyrighted 1961, the hardcover edition by Random House, and it's authored by a man named T.H. Tetons, last name T E T. E-N-S. I'm going to read you a little bit about his background here. From the back cover of the book, T.H. Tettens, a leading expert on German geopolitics, was born in Berlin and worked during the 1920s in Germany as an economist and newspaper editor. For more than 30 years, he has studied the pan-German movement, the Nazi party, and the strategic theories of German geopolitics. When Hitler came to power, Mr. Tettens was put in a concentration camp. He escaped to Switzerland in 1934. There, in pamphlet and newspaper articles, he foretold the coming German assault on Europe. In 1938, Mr. Tettens came to the United States and began research on German problems for government agencies and private organizations. From 1946 to 1947, he served with the U.S. War Crimes Commission in Washington. Okay, so that is the background concerning Mr. Tettens. Now, from his book, The uh, New Germany and the Old Nazis, reading as follows. Now, keep in mind that uh, Conrad Adenauer had uh, obviously worked very closely with the Third Reich. Uh, he wouldn't have gotten his French slave laborers, and he uh, wrote a letter that we just saw talking all about how, yeah, I'm working with you guys, you know, uh, I think you're great stuff. Now, Keep in mind that two of his top officials were a guy named Herbert Blankenhorn, we're not going to talk about him here, and a guy named Hans Globke. Hans Globke, last name G-L-O-B-K-E, was the first Secretary of State of the Third Reich and uh, was one of the most powerful people in Konrad Adenauer's government, sort of nominally the number two man, but according to many authorities, as we're going to see here, he was the number one man in the Third Reich. Okay, Hans Globke was the first Secretary of State under Der Alte, under Konrad Adenauer. Reading now from T.H. Tetten's The New Germany and the Old Nazis. Under the Nazi regime, Hans Globke served as the top official in the Office for Jewish Affairs in the Ministry of the Interior. It was here that the infamous Nuremberg Laws for the protection of the German blood were first drafted. The man who signed the racial laws against the Jews, Interior Minister Dr. Wilhelm Freak, last name F-R-I-C-K, was sentenced to death by the International Court in Nuremberg and hanged on October 16, 1946. And the one directly involved with the formulation of these laws was Dr. Hans Glubke. 
It was he who drafted the text of Hitler's race law and who wrote the notorious commentary, unquote, interpreting this Nuremberg law, which paved the way for the extermination of millions of human beings. When the Nazis decided to carry out the mass liquidation of European Jews, Dr. Globke's direct superior, Ministerial Counsel Bernard Lösner, L-O-E-S-N-E-R, himself a party member, had scruples of conscience and resigned from office. His post was taken over by Dr. Hans Globke. As chief legal advisor and head of the Office of Jewish Affairs, Dr. Globke thus became a direct participant in the gigantic venture to make Germany Judenrein, or Jew-free, of course. In applying the racial laws, Dr. Globke worked hand-in-hand -hand with the main security office, the headquarters of the SS murder organization. That is the aforementioned RSHA, the Reich Sicherheitshauptamt, that we're going to come back to later. Returning now to the text of T.H. Tetten's The New German and the Old Nazis. Der Spiegel of September 28, 1960, reported a case which reveals that Dr. Globke had direct dealings with the SS Colonel Adolf Eichmann. More than that, the evidence shows that Dr. Globke was a key administrator in The Final Solution, unquote, the master plan for the extermination of the Jews. The article in Der Spiegel quoted the testimony of a Wehrmacht officer, Max Merten, M-E-R-T-E-N, who together with Eichmann suggested in 1943 that 20,000 Jews in Macedonia, that's in Greece, marked for the gas chambers in Auschwitz should be released and shipped to Palestine. It was obviously not a feeling of humanity, but rather a personal greed for money, as well as a shortage of transportation facilities to the concentration camps that motivated both Nazis to make this suggestion. According to the story in Der Spiegel, Merton and Eichmann reached Dr. Globke and tried to obtain permission from the Office of Jewish Affairs for the release of the prisoners. Their efforts were in vain. Dr. Globke insisted on the strict execution of the Fuhrer's order. That sealed the fate of the 20,000 Jews who were then shipped in cattle cars to Auschwitz. Why Dr. Adenauer could not find another man capable of setting up a true democratic civil service has never been explained. Whatever lies behind this mystery, the fact is that Dr. Hans Globke, who faithfully served the Nazi hierarchy, became one of the most powerful men in the Federal Republic. Recouping a little bit of what uh, Tetens has uh, relayed here, Hans Globke was not only head of the Office of Jewish Affairs, he drew up the Nazi racial law, the law for the protection of the German blood, which provided the legal basis for the extermination not only of the Jews, but of gypsies and many other ethnic groups as well. Keep that in mind as you hear how powerful he became in the new Germany, quote-unquote. Yes, bear in mind also that the man who, who signed those particular regulations was hanged, and that uh, the man who drew them up wound up to become basically second-in-command of the West German Republic. Okay, reading further from T.H. Tetten's The New German and the Old Nazis, it says, and this is uh, uh, around uh, 19, the 1960s, early 1960s this was written, the German press has called Dr. Globke, quote, the gray eminence, the power behind the throne, and the spider. Die Welt of October 30th, 1955, which is a German newspaper, described Dr. Globke as, quote, the second in command in the control tower of the German ship of state, unquote. According to Die Welt, Dr. Globke is, quote, the only man who has access to Adenauer at all times or who can call the Chancellor at any hour. The paper adds, quote, Globke's political power rests entirely on the confidence which emanates from his chief and on his domination over the official apparatus which must be regarded as his exclusive handiwork. Bearing in mind that at this time, uh, the uh, Conrad Adenauer was in his 70s, his late 70s, I believe, at that point, um, and uh, was called Der Alta, or the old man. Uh, Dr. Globke being the only man who's allowed to wake Adenauer up, we might say that he was, in fact, uh, somewhat analogous to Ed Meese in the uh, West German government. Re read that last sentence for them again. That one goes by so quick. That's a really important sentence there. Now. Indeed. Globke's political power, this is according to Die Welt, rests entirely on the confidence which emanates from his chief and on his domination over the official apparatus, which must be regarded as his exclusive handiwork. And as I read the next section, you're going to find out part of what that official apparatus contains. Skipping on down. The result of Dr. Globke's clever manipulations is that, as chief assistant to Dr. Adenauer, he makes decisions about a great many affairs in the federal government. 
A full-page article in the Deutsche Zeitung of June 11, 1958, explained how Dr. Globke is able to wield rigid control over every ministry. The various government departments have to submit monthly reports about their activities and plans, which all end up on Globke's desk. According to this analysis, no minister can make an important decision without the approval of Dr. Globke. It is the secret Secretary of State who convenes cabinet meetings and determines their agenda. The Deutsche Zeitung described Globke as the head of a huge staff, a super ministry, led by 36 senior officials, which constitutes the hub of the entire government machinery. It is Globke who decides what part of the incoming mail reaches the chancellor. Nominations for appointments to high positions in all ministries are made by Dr. Globke. The result is that every ministry is run either by dependable friends or loyal servants of Dr. Globke. The Christian Science Monitor has stated that this concentration of government power in the hands of a single man has made observers, quote, bitterly complain that Dr. Globke often has had more authority than cabinet ministers, unquote. The New York Times correspondent Sidney Grusin gave the following appraisal, quote, as state secretary of the chancellery, Dr. Globke is acknowledged to be one of the most influential men in West Germany. He runs the Chancellor's office, and nearly all papers for the Chancellor must first go through his hands. Ironically, the one-time servant of the Nazi regime today has full control over the Office for the Protection of the Constitution. Also, under Globke's direct authority, is the operation of a super-secret organization headed by Hitler's former spy chief, Lieutenant General Reinhard Galen. Worth noting now again, not only did Galen work for the CIA, but eventually his organization became the official NATO intelligence organization, and after that, the BND, the Bundesnachrichtendienst, the West German CIA, which, as we've seen, was directly under Globke's control. So uh, Galen, Seeks, Augsburg, Akmatelli, and the whole gang working with, uh, un underneath, I should say, under the supervision of Globke. Not on only were key Nazis uh, put into the government, but the government policies of West Germany have, to a large extent, assumed many aspects of Nazi foreign policy. In other words, we, didn't, we don't just have the people in there, we have them executing, or at least attempting to execute, some of the same kinds of policies as we saw under Hitler. Now, in this section, the next section, again, from T.H. Uh, Tetton's The New German and the Old Nazis, we're going to see a, a very interesting use of the German nationals who were basically expelled from the previously Nazi-dominated eastern territories, uh, Poland, Czechoslovakia, the Soviet Union, and so forth. They were then, the, th those people who were actually ethnic Germans were sent back to Germany uh, after World War II. Now, these uh, ethnic Germans were used by the West German government uh, as a source of agitation for eastern expansion of the German Republic. Sound familiar? Well, we're going to get into this right now. We're again, returning to the New Germany and the Old Nazis. Large groups of Sudeten Germans and Volksdeutsche in Poland played a vital role in the Hitler Holocaust. They filled the ranks of the SS, and they fought fanatically to Germanize the Slavic lands. It was in the light of this record that the Allies decided at Yalta and Potsdam to set the oder nisa line as a final stop to Germany's century-old Drang nach Osten push to the east. Most Nazis had fled, and the rest of the plotters were sent home in order to end all further conspiracies. What else could the Allies have done? Had not the cry Heim ins Reich vibrated throughout Europe in the heyday of National Socialism? When in 1945, fate caught up with the Sudeten Germans and the Volksdeutsche, they were simply sent, quote, home to Germany, unquote. Soon after the end of World War II, the Germans started to use the expelé question as a lever for a revision of the Yalta and Potsdam decision. Under the Allied occupation statute, the refugees were not permitted to organize. Nevertheless, they appeared in public as early as 1949 with a highly effective apparatus for mass propaganda. The refugee newspapers, among them the Volksbote in Munich and Die Stimme der Vertreibenen in Hamburg, began to agitate openly. 
There is little doubt that the expellees played an important part in the calculations of Dr. Nauman and his associates in Madrid. Uh, interrupting here, Dr. Nauman was the uh, one of Joseph Goebbels' top propaganda officials and designated by Goebbels as his propaganda successor should he pass on for the Third Reich. He was arrested by the British in 1953 for plotting with a bunch of other ex-Nazis to restore Nazism in Germany. Returning again to the book, T The New Germany and the Old Nazis by T.H. Tettens. There is little doubt that the expellees played an important part in the calculations of Dr. Naumann and his associates in Madrid. A secret circular letter issued in 1950 by the Nazi headquarters in Madrid stated, The millions of expellees must be regarded as a valuable trump card in our policy toward the restoration of German power. The expulsion of 10 million German racial comrades was a blessing for the Reich. The expellees strengthened the biological substance of our race and from the beginning, they became a valuable asset to our propaganda. The ex discontented with their fate, infused a strong political dynamism in our demands. Very soon, we were able to drown out the noisy propaganda about German crimes, unquote, with our, with our counter-accusation about the heinous misdeeds committed against 10 million German racial comrades. The distress of the refugees has created a common political ground among all Germans, regardless of political affiliation. The demand for the restitution of the stolen German territories keeps our political agitation alive. The militant elements among the refugees are working according to the best traditions of National Socialism, whereas the broad masses among the expellees are kept close together in well-disciplined homeland organizations. The expulsion of millions of our racial comrades provides us with a heaven-sent opportunity to exacerbate the problem of the bleeding border and to hammer constantly for its revision. For years, there has been a tremendous propaganda drive to bring the more than 10 million refugees back to their homelands, unquote. This campaign has been carried on with the full support of the Adenauer government. Bonn has nourished the hope among the Germans that through a policy of strength, unquote, the lost territories in the East can be recovered. It was precisely this view which motivated the Adenauer government to pursue a policy of diplomatic non-recognition toward all East European states. In 1952 and 1953, Dr. Adenauer and his assistants openly advocated a program of liberation. The day after his election victory in 1953, the Chancellor, in a fiery speech in Bonn, demanded the befrying of the territories in the East, quote, but instead of reunification, let us talk rather of liberation, befrying, the liberation of our brethren in slavery in the East. That is our aim, and that we shall achieve, but only with outside help. Okay, and before I continue, I want to just mention that you are listening to KFJC 89.7, Los Altos Hills. Continuing on, right where Dave left off. A year before that... At a press interview in Washington, the Chancellor's principal diplomatic assistant, State Secretary Walter Hallstein, defined the area to be liberated as reaching up to the Ural Mountains. At that time, the Germans dreamed of a third power block between America and the Soviet bloc of 550 million people, including a Slavic population of more than 200 million now living within the Soviet bloc. Let me just cut in here for a moment. Now, when they say a year before that, they're talking about in 1952, okay? This is fully seven years after World War II as it ended, um, several years after democracy has uh, been reinstalled in West, in West Germany, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. The Germans are dreaming of a, an area up to the Soviet Ural Mountains as being now uh, a possession of Germany and a power block of 550 million people under direct German control, including Slavics. Slavs uh, to the tune of 200 million people. The liberation concept had been freely and frequently discussed at that time in the Rheinische Merkur. One of the Chancellor's staunchest supporters, Dr. Robert Ingram, admonished the German politicians to discard the sterile concept of reunification and substitute for it a dynamic program of liberation. Quote, the task is not reunification, but the liberation of all that has been lost stated Dr. Ingram in a lead article. There remained little doubt that Bonn's liberation program envisioned the use of all possible means. It was Hitler's Drang nach Osten, drive to the east, all over again. Among the cities pinpointed for liberation by Dr. Ingram were Warsaw, Prague, and Vienna. 
The unrestrained liberation propaganda of the early 50s created such unease in diplomatic quarters at Paris and London that Dr. Adenauer was soon compelled to renounce military force as a means to recover the lost territories. Since then, the new formula in the Chancellor's statements concerning reunification and revision of the Odernisa line has become, quote, in peace and freedom. However, apart from the Chancellor's official position, there is a very different cast to the speeches by other cabinet members before the huge refugee rallies. These revisionist overtones have not contributed toward dispelling the fears in the eastern capitals of a revengeful pan-Germanism. Let me just stress that point again, because this is a key one. We're talking about the Cold War. We're talking a shooting...